Witamy bardzo serdecznie na wykładzie w ramach projektu John Paul II Mission for Marriage, który poprowadzi Katrina Zeno. Katrina mieszka w Stanach Zjednoczonych, w Phoenix, Arizona. Od ponad 20 lat zajmuje się teologią ciała Jana Pawła II. Jest wykształcenia teologiem i opowie nam, w jaki sposób więź małżeńska opowiada o czasach ostatecznych, o tym, jak będzie w niebie. Serdecznie zapraszamy. Hello and welcome to this talk entitled Heaven and the Great Mystery, Mistero Grande. Uh, my name is Katrina Zeno and I want to begin this talk by expressing my gratitude to the Lord for my very unlikely friendship with Agatha and Andrew. Now, as most of you probably know, Agatha and Andrew live in Poland and I live in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States, hot and sunny. And we live thousands of miles, kilometers apart. However, the Lord permitted us to meet each other in Sydney, Australia. And so it was because of this, tri this trinity of countries, Poland, United States, and Australia, that Agatha and Andrew and I met, all because of St. John Paul II, Theology of the Body, and Mistero Grande. So of course that means that Italy is included in this wonderful trinity as well. I want to share with you how I got involved in Theology of the Body. And it begins in the summer of 1992, when my son and I, for his fifth birthday, just happened to be in Rome, and we were able to attend Pope John Paul II's private morning mass. And after mass, we were ushered into a large audience hall, and John Paul II came along and greeted each group, handed them a papal rosary, shook their hand, and then moved on. However, when he came to us, I had given my son, who was five at the time, blonde-haired, blue eyes, very adorable, and I had given him a little book entitled Titles of Mary. And so he gave that book to John Paul II, so John Paul II stopped. He took the book, he bent down, and he kissed my son. I think that makes him a third-class relic, having been kissed by a saint. And then he looked at me and I said, we're from Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And I saw the light of recognition go off in his eyes, and he reached out his hand, and he placed it on my forehead, and he blessed me. And in that moment, I experienced receiving a portion of his spirit. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, at the time, I didn't know anything about the theology of the body, and in fact, I really didn't know much about the pontificate of John Paul II. But in that moment, the Holy Spirit was already pouring into me the graces I would need for the mission that the Lord would eventually entrust to me. And that's exactly what has happened. For the past 23 years, I have been speaking and teaching on St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body to a whole wide variety of audiences. I like to say Theology of the Body is for everyone. So in my speaking ministry, I've noticed something a little bit curious, which is that the majority of Catholic faith formation ends at redemption. Now, most of us were pretty familiar with God's plan for life in the beginning. You know, the way that he created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden for union and communion. And then, unfortunately, we're also very familiar with the effects of original sin because we experience them in our own lives. But as you know, that's not the end of the story because we also have our redemption in Christ. But that's not the end of the story either. You see, John Paul II goes even further than the beginning, than the fall, than redemption in Christ. John Paul II wants to take us to heaven, to our ultimate perfection and happiness. So that's what I'd like to do in this talk, is to take us to heaven with St. John Paul II to reflect on our ultimate perfection and happiness. So I have a true confession to make, that before Theology of the Body changed my life, before that encounter with St. John Paul II that eventually led to my mission, I was a Catholic follower of Platon without even, I'm sorry, I was a Catholic follower of Plato without even knowing it. 
Now, you may be familiar with Plato, who was a Greek philosopher who lived about 2,400 years ago. And in his circle of influence and in his teachings, he taught that the soul is the true nature of the person and that the body is like a prison that traps the soul. And so the goal of life, the goal of happiness is to liberate the soul from the prison of the body. So for Plato, that means the body. I mean, he would never have a theology of the body because for Plato, the body is irrelevant. It's unnecessary to who we are as persons and our ultimate perfection. So please tell me, true or false? Jesus came to save souls. What do you think? Who says it's true? Two thumbs up. Who says it's false? Two thumbs down. Okay, well, the answer is Jesus came to save persons. He came to save persons because as human person, it, persons, it's our very nature to be embodied. From the beginning, God created you and me as a unique body, spirit, unity, Genesis 2-7. He formed us from clay of the ground and breathed into us the breath of life, his spirit, his ruah. So to be a human person is to be this unique body, spirit, unity. So I'd like you to turn to your spouse or the person next to you and please express your affection for him or her without using your body. Oh, wait a minute. I saw that. You cheated, right? You tried to use your body, didn't you? Maybe you lifted your eyebrows or you gave a smile. You see, it's impossible. It's impossible because we can only express love through the body. But why is that? Why can't we just express love only with the soul. Well, it's because God created the world, including us, with a sacramental structure and, and design. And so that means in God's plan, the invisible and the visible go together. You see, in God's design, the spiritual, the ruah, and the material, the clay, the dust of the ground, go together. In God's design, God and the body, the human body, go together. This is God's plan. Spirituality and sexuality go together. What a beautiful privilege it is to be Catholics, to be able to live and learn and deepen our understanding of God's sacramental structure and design, where the visible and invisible are meant to go together. So this means that our eternal happiness in heaven can't be a state of the soul alone, separated from the body. You see, Plato got it wrong. So get used to your body because it'll be with you for all eternity. Isn't that great news? Okay, some of you are not very thrilled at hearing that you will have your body for all eternity. So am I just making this up? Please tell me, what is the basis for the resurrection of the body? It's the fact that the tomb is empty. You know, that is the first kerygma, the first gospel that was preached by the disciples. Christ is risen from the dead. And if you read Acts, the first chapters of Acts, whenever the kerygma, whenever the gospel message is preached, it says, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. And this means that Jesus, the Son of God and Son of Man, shows us the ultimate destiny of our bodies. So that leads to an important question. Will our resurrected bodies be the same or different than they are now? Okay, so that body watching this video, enjoying this conference, will that body be the same or different? in your resurrected body? Well, the answer is both, both. That means it's voting time. So I'm gonna give you three options, here they are. When Christ comes back again at his second coming, what we call the eschaton, do you think that John Paul II says, finally, we get rid of the body? Okay, that's answer A. Or do you think John Paul II says, finally, the spirit conquers the body? Okay, that's answer B. Or do you think John Paul II says, finally, the body perfectly expresses the spirit? That's answer C. So who says it's A? Finally, ha, we get rid of the body. 
Okay, who says it's answer B? Finally, the spirit conquers the body. Oh, you guys are so smart. Who says that it's answer C? Finally, the body perfectly expresses the spirit. Oh, that's the promise. That's the hope of the resurrection of our bodies. In Theology of the Body, audience 67, number one, John Paul II says this, in the resurrection, the body will return to perfect unity and harmony with the spirit. Can you hear the sacramental design? Body and spirit, visible and invisible, go together, even in eternity. Now, I have a very dear friend. Her name is Dr. Mary Healy, and she likes to use the image of a stained glass window to express the resurrection of our body. So I want you to imagine for a moment, you're out on the street and you walk by a big cathedral and you see a stained glass window from the outside, only it doesn't really draw your attention because it's kind of gray. It's dull, it's drab. You, you know, you might look at it for a few seconds saying, wow, that's pretty intricate, but then you'd walk right on by. But now I'd like you to imagine that in walking right on by, you walk into the cathedral and now you look at the stained glass window and can you imagine what it looks like? It's brilliant. Have you ever seen the, the rose window from the Cathedral of Notre Dame or some cathedral in, in your town or in Italy or Poland? Right? It's stunningly beautiful. You can see the colors. They're vibrant. You can see every detail and you just want to stand and gaze at the beauty of the stained glass window. Well, that's a lovely image of your resurrected and glorified body. You see, in eternity, in your perfected state, you will be stunningly beautiful. We will want to gaze at each other's glorified bodies for all eternity. You see, this means our heavenly happiness is the perfection of our embodied human nature. When body and spirit, as John Paul II reminded us, are reunited perfectly, but that's not the end. There's more. We are reunited perfectly body and spirit, and then we experience full participation in the inner life of the Trinity in our glorified bodies. So it's true. You will have your body for all eternity, and that is very, very good news. So turn to the person next to you and say, that's very good news. You will have your body for all eternity. What many people don't realize is that theology of the body actually has a crescendo. It's moving somewhere, right? It begins with life in the beginning, and then we fall, and then we rebound with redemption in Christ, but then we continue up, up, up to our life in heaven. And in John Paul II's section on our perfection for all eternity, there is actually a crescendo of the crescendo. And it has to do with God's greatest desire. Have you ever thought about the fact that God has a greatest desire for you? What do you think that that could be? What is God's greatest desire for you? Well, the way I like to describe it is God's greatest desire is to give himself to you totally. That's God's greatest desire is to give himself to you totally in love. And when God gives himself to you totally in love, in your glorified body, the church has a very particular word to describe this. It's called divinization. Divinization. Now, again, before theology of the body changed my life, I'd never heard the word divinization. And perhaps maybe it's the first time you're hearing this word as well. Well, in audience 67, again, the crescendo of the crescendo, John Paul II gives us his beautiful and stunning description of divinization. Here's what he wrote. Here's his description. Participation in the divine nature. Participation in the inner life of God himself. Penetration and permeation of what is essentially human, meaning you, your human nature, by what is essentially divine will then reach its peak 
In divinization, listen to those words. You are penetrated and permeated your humanity by divinity so that God completely saturates every part of your unique personhood. So when God gives himself to you totally, is this going to cancel you out? Is it going to annihilate you? Or maybe for some people, I think, and for some religions, the way they think of our human nature in eternity is kind of as if God is a big ocean, maybe a big ocean of love or mercy. And we're, we're like little drops that get dropped into the big ocean of God's love and mercy and we disappear into God. Is that what John Paul II is saying? That when God gives himself to you totally, when you are fully divinized, that it will cancel you out? No, not at all. Instead, here's the way I like to think about what John Paul II has just described. Okay, here you are in your glorified body. I have a little sponge person here. And you're, you are raised, glorified, and your body and spirit are perfectly reunited. And then what? You are immersed into the inner life of the Trinity. You are penetrated and permeated what is essentially human by what is essentially divine. And you see what happens is it doesn't cancel you out. It doesn't annihilate you. It's just the opposite. John Paul II says you will become even more of who God always created you to be. You see, in heaven, you won't disappear into God, but you will become everything everything that God always desired you to be, both body, soul, and spirit. You will be in perfect union and communion with God in your glorified body forever. So please tell me, where do you already experience union and communion with God in your body here on earth? Well, as Catholics, we know the answer is the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Is this just a symbol? When we receive communion, are we just receiving a piece of bread? No, as Catholics, we believe that when the Holy Spirit comes upon that bread and wine, it is transubstantiated. It is changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying to you through the priest, through the holy ordination of that man who stands in persona Christi, he is saying to every one of us, this is my body given up for you. In Ephesians 5, 31 to 32, St. Paul speaks about this reality, although he doesn't say it explicitly. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Now Paul is quoting Genesis 2.24. But notice he doesn't stop there. There is more. He goes on to say, This is a great mystery. Mistero Grande. I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Well, please tell me, who is the church? You are. Every single one of you as a baptized Catholic, you are the church. That means five, Ephesians 5, 31 to 32 is written about you. You see, when you receive the Eucharist, the great mystery happens in you, in your body. Because every time you receive the Eucharist, you become one body with Christ. This mystery is great. I speak in reference to Christ in the church because in the Eucharist, you enter into a one flesh union and communion with Christ. And in that moment, the two, bride and bridegroom, Christ in the church, your body and the glorified body of Christ become one. And the great mystery happens in you. You see, the great mystery, the mysterio grande, is not only that husband and wife can become one flesh. I pray that you espouses, that you realize the great and immense privilege it is 
every time you have the opportunity, the noble opportunity to give yourselves totally to each other, and the two become one flesh. But that's not the great mystery. The great mystery is that we, you and I, can become one body, one flesh with God. And in doing so in the Eucharist, we fulfill what we were always created for, for the great mystery to happen in us with God. In the marital embrace, then, in the conjugal act, husband and wife, are they two? Or are they one? The answer is both. Both. They're two, but they're one. But they're two, but they're one. Because in the conjugal embrace, the husband doesn't cancel or swallow up the wife. And the wife doesn't cancel or swallow up the husband. They remain distinct and yet fully united. In the Eucharist, are you in Christ Are you two or are you one? The answer is both. Because Christ remains Christ and you remain you. Christ's divinity doesn't swallow you up or annihilate you. Nor does Christ become you, your humanity. No, no, no. In the Eucharist, your humanity is penetrated and permeated by the divine and glorified body of Christ. And so that leads us to heaven. In your glorified body in heaven, are you and the glorified body of Christ, are you two or are you one? By now I'm sure you know the answer. The answer is both. Which is why we need a glorified body so that for all eternity we can be one body, one flesh with the glorified body of Christ so that we are fully united and yet still fully distinct because you don't disappear into God. God doesn't cancel you out. He brings you to the fullness of what you were always created to be by being one body, one flesh with the glorified body of Christ. You see, John Paul II, after many years of studying theology of the body, helped me connect the dots of the great mystery of the Mysterio Grande between the Eucharist, marriage, and heaven. So what's the one reality that is, impre- that is present in all three of those things? In the Eucharist, in marriage, and our ultimate perfection in heaven? The answer is the body. We need a body for the Eucharist, Christ's glorified body and our own human body. We need a body for marriage. Two souls can't get married. It has to be two embodied persons. And we need a body for all eternity so that we can be united to the glorified body of Christ in a holy union and communion for all eternity. You see, this is the immense privilege and gift of being embodied persons. Because Christ says to us in the Eucharist, this is my body given up for you. Husband and wife say to each other every day of your marriage and in a very particular way in the marital embrace, you say, this is my body given up for you. And God says to us, for all eternity, in His glorified body, to our glorified bodies, this is my body given up for you. Why? So that we can be fully divinized. So that we can live a total gift of self in love, both here on this earth, in the Eucharist, in marriage, and for all eternity in our glorified bodies. This is my body given totally to you for one flesh holy union and communion. That is the privilege of being Catholic and the privilege of knowing a theology of the body where we can be one body with Christ now and for all eternity. And we can live the great mystery, not only in our marriages, but with the eternal and glorified bridegroom, Jesus Christ, 
who wants to dwell and abide in the center of your life and in the center of your marriage. So I'd like to end with a prayer, asking for the Holy Spirit to make this great mystery occur in us even more and even more. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for the great gift of our bodies. Thank you that sometimes we were unaware of what a gift it is to have a body and what a gift it is that the second person of the Blessed Trinity became flesh and dwelt among us, took on a body so that he could offer his total gift of self on the cross and in the Eucharist and it could be raised and glorified and continued to be offered us to us and await for our perfection and full divinization in heaven. But Jesus, we haven't always appreciated our bodies. As a matter of fact, some of us have despised our bodies, or we've thought that we, our bodies are ugly, or that God couldn't possibly love our bodies, or that like Plato, what really mattered was the soul, and that the body is kind of irrelevant and even unnecessary to truly be holy. But through the great mystery, through St. Paul telling us that this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. I speak in reference to Christ and the church. You have focused our attention on the gift of the body in the one flesh union of husband and wife that is an image, a mirror, a reflection of the one flesh union that Christ wants to have for us in the Eucharist and for all eternity. And Lord, I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon every married couple that they would experience you dwelling in the very center of their marriage, that they would experience you dwelling in their bodies and in the union and communion in their bodies, in the marital embrace. Lord, and I pray for every person watching this video that he or she would experience the great mystery happening in him or her through the gift, the total gift of self and love that you have given us to us through your body in the Eucharist. And so we offer to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is our spiritual worship, this living sacrifice of our bodies so that we might dwell in the very center of the Trinity and be penetrated and permeated our humanity by your divinity. And we pray this through Christ, our Lord and divine bridegroom. Amen.